I always remember my mom's friends that they, she, they, also, they were always encouraging me to get in plastic surgery. Because, of course, they was looking for themselves when they got elder. <laughs> but I decide, I decide to become a urologist. And when I say urologist, some people misunderstood I am a neurologist. And I say, no, I'm a urologist. <laughs> and when we say urologist, it's, we're not only taking care of this area. We also take care of kidneys, bladder, stones, infections. We, we see a lot of things. But basically, um, we see, and many people see us because we see prostates. It's very important, but because when we are urologists and when we go a party, is typically there's going to be two questions. The first one is going to be, I have a friend of a friend <laughs> that has some kind of erection or some kind of problem, and they never will recognize of themselves until the end of the party. And the second is going to come with all the jokes about urology. That's when all the jokes begin. And I always remember when I, when I always the patient have a different funny joke, and the most one that I always remember is, for example, I had one that he told me, after I did the rectal exam, he told me, who's going to call me next? Are you going to call me tomorrow? <laughs> Are you going to send me flowers tomorrow? <laughs> and I say, wow. <laughs> There's, in, you can imagine how many jokes you can get about rectal exam. And of course, because they see us as a prostate. And of course, prostate has its own ribbon, and there's celebrities that take care and make the awareness for prostate cancer. Same thing happened for testicular cancer. There's athletics, there's also a ribbon, and many people are aware about testicular cancer. But I bet you that you don't know that also you can get cancer in the penis. <laughs> and I always ask, did you know the penis also can get cancer? And many people, of course, get surprised because they don't even know that the penis can also get cancer. And it's very important because the good news, different than prostate and testicular cancer, is that this type of cancer, we can prevent it. And that's good news. And what we're going to talk today is that we're going to give you exactly how we can deal and how we can prevent the penile cancer. The penis is a very, very complex organ. It's very difficult to think that you can transplant a penis. And we're going to talk that at the end. It's very important because it's not only for urination. It has to be with reproduction because these this sperms, the semen goes out through the urethra. It has to be with intercourse relations, and it has to be with identity. And that's why it's so difficult that uh, if we section some of the penis, uh, what are we going to do to preserve <laughs> the function? And, and when we see this, I was trying to illustrate that the treatment can be dramatically sometimes. If we don't make the diagnose on time, that we can give some local treatment that we can freeze or we can burn the small tumor. If it's too deep or too extensive, sometimes we need to make sections. And sometimes we need to do a complete excision of the penis and the scrotum. It calls complete phallectomy or penectomy. And then I, I always ask this question, how many men could live a full life without penis? And that's why it's very important that when we see a patient that has penile cancer, we have to really create a very good relation with the patient. Because when we give that bad news, the first thing they want to go is run away. And when they come back and they found that you was right, it's going to be too late. And then you have to spend your time to explain him exactly what you have to do. And you need to convince him that you need to do some specific treatment. Sometimes you need to resect some of the penis. But if you don't explain that on, on time, they will get upset. They will deny what they have and they run away. And when they come back, they will have metastasis, and they will, they will die. Then it's very important in this specific, because of course you're relating with the most intimate part of the patient. What about the incidence? There are going to be 26,000 26, cases globally. In the United States, this year is going to be more than 2,000 cases for penile cancer. Even that in the United States is one for 100,000 patients, in Brazil, for example, in some areas of Brazil, the penile cancer is more common than prostate cancer. To give you an idea, we always see prostate cancer. In some areas of Brazil, penile cancer is going to be more common than prostate cancer. It means that really this is an important issue in some areas. 
In the United States, what touched me more is that 72% of the affected are Hispanics. And that's why I feel that as a Latino, as a Venezuelan human, I found that it's very, very important that we teach and we, uh, we educate the people how to prevent this problem. Not only that it's more frequent in Hispanic, is that Hispanic develop penile cancer at younger age. It means not that we detect it younger. It means that they develop the cancer earlier. Very important, even with all the signs and all the advance that we have had in medicine, we have decreased and we have improved the survival for many cancers, including prostate and breast. But if you see here, it's very important that even during 2012 and 2013, you see the reports, the survival for penile cancer, instead of getting better, is getting worse. Around 40, 50 percent of the patients are going to be died at five years. And that's very important that we need to do something. We need to invest resources in, 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 in science to not only make educate the patient, we need to also see how we can improve the survival of these patients. Why these patients are coming late to treatment? In some countries, maybe they don't have access to the health system, but in the United States, they're not coming, not because they don't have access to the health system. They're not coming first because they're ashamed what they have. Second, because they have fear. And third, because they don't know how risky could be what they have. And they, could, they never imagined that could be cancer. And they could never imagine they can die because of that. And that's why they come late with that uh, lesions. What are the symptoms? Basically, any kind of ulceration, tumor, any growth, anything that you found in your penis that it doesn't resolve after a few weeks of treatment, you have to go back and tell them this is not normal. And you may require a biopsy to rule out that there's nothing else that anything that, no, it's a fungal infection. Be careful. You need to check there's really not a cancer behind that. What are the risk factors? Basically, these are the most important factors. HPV, human papilloma virus, pure hygiene and low socioeconomic status, lack of circumcision, and smoking. I want to be very clear about HPV, a human papilloma virus because I don't want to get people afraid that if they have HPV or they have warts, they're going to have penile cancer. This is not an acute process. This is something that is a chronic inflammation. And if you have one of the risk factors, it can be HPV, smoking, we're going to see uncircumcised, smegma, all these risk factors, a, long, a very long period of inflammation will end or could end in a penile cancer. It doesn't mean that if you have HPV, you're going to have cancer. It means you have one risk factor and you have to pay attention. Because if you have HPV, there's in patients with HPV, it's six times more common that they can have um, cancer. And also, when we dissect the tumor, the penal cancer, we found that in the tissue of the penal cancer, there's up to 85% they found the virus. There's obvious a relation between the virus and the cancer. But again, again, it doesn't mean that if you have HPV, you're going to have cancer. The same thing for cervical cancer. If you have HPV, it doesn't mean you're going to have cancer. You have a risk factor, and you have to take care of that risk factor to don't add more factors that you're going to end in having a chronic inflammation process that can end longly in a cancer. The second risk, of course, when we talk about HPV, the, vac the vaccine is not only for cervical cancer. It can be also helpful for penile cancer. Sexual behavior is very important because the people feel that the condom is important, of course, but it's not enough. The condom will not protect all the genital area, and most important, you, know, you may know your partner. Poor hygiene, very important. You see this uh, slide with all this smegma. Some of these patients have uh, uh, all the foreskin that does, does not retract, and if it does, doesn't retract, they can have a tumor behind that skin and they never see it. Then it's very important that they have this hygiene. They need to retract the foreskin. They need to learn how to have all the, uh, how to clean it and to prevent that. Very important, when we talk about hygiene, we, everybody knows that patient that was circumcised when they was newborn, they have less chance of having penile cancer. That's right. 
But there's a very interesting study, for example, this Danish, Danish series. They, they found that the rate of circumcision is only 1.6, and they decreased the cancer incidence between 1.15 to 0.8, only doing and improving the hygiene, not doing circumcision. The conclusion is what we need is better education for hygiene habits, not circumcision. The circumcision is only recommended, and you're going to see that I, I shave it. I did the circumcision. <laughs> Very important that the circumcision is only recommended in regions where minimum condition of hygiene cannot be guaranteed for men. That's the only indication for circumcision. The real indication is we need to do education and we need to improve the hygiene habits. Smoking, three, four, three, three to five times more common penile cancer in, in patients that smoke. And very important, I want to I wanna say very clear that we have improved in the treatments. We have improved how to make, how to preserve the penis. Okay, but sometimes, of course, we need to do partial or complete remove. And of course, sometimes we also need to remove the lymph nodes around the area. We have improved also that. We have decreased the morbidity of the treatment, but that's not enough. We, we should really go one step before. We need to really decrease the incidence of penile cancer. This is one, um, again, there have been only three penile transplant in the world. And we have to be clear that this is not an option because this is not a partial phallectomy that you need. This is a patient that are immunosuppressed. You cannot do a transplant. And then we have not be clear that this is not the way to go. We need to prevent the penile cancer, and then if no, we need to see how we can improve the treatment to decrease the morbidity of the surgery. This is an example of a patient that you can see that the tumor already destroyed the complete penis. And additional to destroy the penis, you have all these leaf nodes. They did a complete phallectomy, and the scrotum, they remove it. And even that, this patient was 21 years old. Seven months later, this patient died. And then we really need to do something to stop this. Because there are men that are dying because of penile cancer. And this is definitely something that we need to treat. As a man, as a physician, and as a father, we're responsible for educate, And we are responsible for speaking with our kids about hygiene habits, about STDs, the STDs are increasing, and we're responsible to talk to them about making and selecting their partners and know their partners, because this is the only way we're going to really decrease the incidence. We need to stop men's dying because of penile cancer. We need to stop men's walking without penis. And this is something we can do together. Thank you for the invitation.